me because people were a lot more friendly and community oriented. Like I said, when I was abroad and I felt a sense of belonging that I've never felt in the United States. All right, everyone, welcome back to Anton's class. On today's awesome episode, I have a special guest. Um, some of you may have seen the last video. I had to, I'm re redoing it, all right? We wanted to bring you the perfect quality. So anyways, you guys, welcome back to Anton's class. On this awesome episode, we have the wonderful Teacher Tess. Teacher Tess, welcome to Anton's class. And would you like to give an introduction about yourself, Teacher Tess, from the Hi. Anton's class community? Hi, Anton's class community. I'm Teacher Tess. Um, I basically have a channel that's basically whatever I want to do under the umbrella of teaching. It's changed a lot. Originally, um, when the quiet time started and everything kind of stopped, I needed to get students. So I kind of started making YouTube videos based on the uh, suggestion of a friend. And now it's kind of spiraled into this. So I'm Teacher Tess from the U.S. And thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yes, you heard it. This is Teacher Tess. And to give you guys a brief background information about how we met, um, we met at Arizona State University. So shout out to ASU. We both got our bachelor's in anthropology. So we both have that shared common interest. We love to travel. We love to experience different cultures. And so we're really here today to share with you guys some of her experiences traveling abroad, because as you know, in the Anton's class community, this community is all about health and wellness. And for me, as well as for teacher Tess, and as well as for a plethora of other people out there, travel has been paramount to our health and wellness journeys. So we're going to go ahead and get into it, you guys. So for me, travel has been important because you know, traveling to Runda, and if you haven't seen my Runda videos, you can click up here. Traveling to Runda and now to Namibia, I have learned more about myself. I've learned more about um, taking time away from the humdrum and the typical life that I experienced in America. And these things have really um, contributed to my health and wellness journey. And being in Africa and in the land of my ancestors itself has also contributed to my health and wellness. So teacher Tess, how has travel been important or instrumental in helping you achieve higher levels of health and wellness? Um, I would like to say, first of all, the United States has a very capitalist, very status driven society. Um, it's very yes. much a materialistic society. Your, your value is really based yeah. on what you have, who you know, and what job you have. And traveling for me to places like Ecuador, Thailand, um, and Vietnam, where there's more of a sense of community, there's more of a sense of working together. Um, families tend to live in what are called multi-generational homes. Like multi-generational. Right, multi-generational homes. Um, and it really made me realize that living in the United States is like living in a fishbowl. In the American culture, there's this idea that if it's important, I would know about it. And when I traveled abroad, it was really obvious that a lot of the news that you see in the United States is actually very suppressed. Because when I was living in London, I, I would see the same stories that were shown in America, and they'd be completely different. There'd be more information. Um, also... Um, when I lived in Ecuador and all the different places I lived, I realized how individualistic the United States is, how anti-family the United States is. I realized how much the United States is a people before profit. And it and there's a culture of you should abandon your family, live on your own. Um, there's not this idea of family businesses. Um, that's part of the ca capitalism. Whereas in a lot of the countries I lived in, you know, if your father was a baker, you learn that trade, which is actually really positive because it's employment, right? That's that's a trade that you have versus here in the United States, it's this whole idea of pulling yourself up from your bootstraps and getting in debt through college. So I think it really helps my wellness, helps my sense of self to realize that a lot of the anxieties I had about in the United States, because in the United States, I'm probably considered working class um, with middle class ideals. 
for the most part, I'm, I'm under the poverty line. So traveling abroad made me realize my value wasn't just in how much money I made and um, what clothes I had or how pretty I was, that there were other things that were valuable about me because people were a lot more friendly and community oriented, like I said, when I was abroad and I felt a sense of belonging that I've never felt in the United States. Thank you. That's a very good point and very beautifully stated. Um, Teacher Tess and I talk often about building community and having like a sense of togetherness and like a tribe. And I absolutely agree with you, Teacher Tess, that capitalism has really affected and infected so many aspects and areas of our lives. And one of those is how it dictates to us that we should consume and overconsume and experience hyper consumerism, where you move out from your family, you separate from your family, and each individual, right, there's like hyper individualism, each individual buys their own car and their own house and their own condo and starts their own nuclear family, right? And that really, in my opinion, chisels away at the experience of community. And so what I would like to institute and what teacher Tess would like to institute as well is having a community, like a commune where people live together, share together, learn together, work together. And I really think living in Africa, that that is the traditional mindset as well and the traditional experience. And she experienced that as well over in Thailand and Vietnam where families are like that. I want to add that America is an extremely expensive place. So not living with your family and buying your own car, doing all that puts you in a situation where you have to work 80 or 90 or hours a week or work three jobs just to do all of that. Whereas if yes. you and your family work together, then you would have you could work less hours, have more quality of life. I think one of the reasons why Americans are so overweight and there's definitely been you know, other documentary studies is if you're working 70 or, 70 or 80 hours a week, you don't have time to sit down and prepare healthy meals, right? And you're just, it, and it feeds into the consumerism because you spend more money when you eat out and that's what they want. You know what I'm saying? It's a Absolutely. consumer Absolutely. capitalist society. And one of the reasons I was really healthy when I was abroad was because I had time to walk to work, to buy healthy foods, you know, whereas in America, on Saturdays, I have to do what's called food prep unless I want to eat bad food, which means I have to spend all day Saturday prepping healthy foods. And hopefully I do eat them because they'll go bad because, you know, fruits and vegetables will go bad. Whereas when I was living abroad, I could walk to the store every day and pick out my healthy meal and go home and cook it because I had time. Right. I wasn't right. my bills weren't so expensive um, that I had to work, you know, from 5 a.m. to, you know, 7 p.m. You know, in a lot of times in America, working as a teacher, I would be working from 5 a.m. To, to, to 10 p.m. And a lot of times because teachers would be out sick, I wouldn't even get a lunch hour because they'd make me substitute for another classroom. So, of course, I'm starving. So I'll just eat candy, you know, whatever crap I can get my hands on. Whereas living abroad, you don't live to work. You work to live. But in America, yeah, absolutely. In America, it's all, it's all about making someone else money. It's all about, it's basically indentured servitude all over again. So um, not having time to go to the store and get healthy foods, constant traffic, you know, uh, working long hours with no break. You know, a lot of people want to blame Americans for being unhealthy. But if you don't have time to buy food and if you do buy healthy food, it goes bad because you don't, you're not home all the time. I mean, of course you're human, you have to feed yourself, you're going to start gaining a lot of weight because f foods that are high in sugar and high in saturated fats don't rot as quickly. And another thing is that in Thailand and Vietnam, a lot of the preservatives we use here in the United States are illegal. And a lot of those preservatives have been linked to obesity because it, it affects your thyroid and affects your metabolism. It slows it down. So when I was living abroad, um, I ate just as much, but I was a lot leaner because the food was a lot healthier versus in the United States. I can eat less in the United States and have a higher BMI based on the food is slowing my metabolism down and it's just bad food. And in America, bad food is everywhere. Whereas in Vietnam and Thailand, you know, street food is mostly vegetables and fruits and there's not any additives. It's just fresh vegetables and fruits. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I like how you pointed it out. I was going to say that and then you said it. In America, we live to work. That's the culture. In other parts of the world, and especially in France, I think they're the ones who coined that, they work to live. They work just enough in order to live. In America, we live to work. Our entire lives are structured around working, right? Even the way our cities are, are um, set up and developed. There's a channel, I'll link it below, that talks about that, how a lot of times in American cities, they aren't functional for human beings. They're functional for capitalism, for work, and for cars, right? So yeah. you have to have a car. That's another reason why there's obesity a lot in the United States is because the diet is a major part, but also Americans don't walk as much. Why? Because our cities weren't designed for walkability. They were designed for cars. You kind of have to own a car in most American cities, right? And I know there's going to be people in the comments saying, well, I live in Cincinnati or I live in San Francisco or New York. Most Americans, we are pressured, we're cultured to, and we're trained by society to purchase a car. And our cities are designed so that you have to have a car. And if yeah. you don't have a car, you're considered a loser. Like in America, we've created a culture of if you live with your family, you're a loser. Something's wrong with you. If you don't have a car, you're a loser. Something's wrong with you. Like there's so many songs yep. like I don't want those scrubs, you know, basically insinuating yep. if you don't have a car, you are a loser. If you live with your family, you're you're a loser. And there's a lot of like media coverage where they'll find the, like the most ridiculous anti-social person and say look at this man living at home and he doesn't work and he's making his parents pay for everything and i'm like most of the people i know who live at home are helping their parents pay rent they're working full time but when the average rents are let's say you make two thousand a month working 40 hours right so you get a second job um so you're working another 20 hours so 40 50 you're working 60 hours a week right so with 60 hours a week you're making around 2000 maybe 500 okay your rent in the is typically 1500 to 2000 so that means you only have 500 dollars left over for food gas and groceries right groceries fresh fruits and vegetables and meat and potatoes groceries in the united states are very expensive as well so then that 500 dollars you have left over and that's in a month so 500 has to get you gas food and you car know, repairs oil changes tires right and so what happens is is people are working 70 they're pushing it right so you're working 75 hours a week when do you sleep i remember when i was working at this one job as a behavioral specialist with children with autism one of my co-workers she was huge she was like 350 pounds she had permanent like black black circles under her eyes she worked three jobs and she typically only slept four to five hours a night now, if you're only sleeping four to five hours a night and you're working that much, what happens is your your body starts to become hungry and you're eating all the time to make up for the lack of sleep. So she was like obese, but it wasn't because she was lazy or, or whatever. It's because she was making so little money. She had to work three jobs just to pay her $1,500 um, rent on top of student loans, on top of, you know, what if her car breaks down, right? And the rents are really expensive in the area of the school. So she was commuting an hour and a half so she could live in, you know, basically the hood, which is a really low income neighborhood. So she's spending through two and a half hours commuting and working three jobs. So she was lucky if she got three hours of sleep a night, which is why she was obese, because the human body, if you're not sleeping, your body starts to crave more sugars and food Ooh. in order to, to make energy because you aren't sleeping. And it, it just greatly frustrates me that that mostly it's people who are obese are people who are impoverished and it's because of the lack of sleep the working all the time and eating overeating to compensate for lack of sleep and i saw that a lot with a lot of my coworkers. um one of my coworkers, she was obese as well she 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 would saturdays and sundays at the end of the month she would she would starve herself because she couldn't after she paid her rent she had no money left over for food Right. So she wouldn't wow. eat for three days. And then when she finally had money for food, she would buy like all these like foods and just what's it called? Binge eat. Oh, right. Oh. And so a lot of the yeah, binge, binge eating I learned when I worked with these like really low income women, I was low income too, is it. But I, I mean, I would not eat junk food because I, I, like I said, had middle class <laughs> ideals. But a lot of these women um, would, wouldn't, wouldn't, it's not that they purposely starve themselves. They literally didn't have money for food. And people be like, oh, they're not good at budgeting. I'm like, okay, if your rent is $1,500, you are making maybe $3,000 to $2,000 a month, and you have to pay for gas, and you're commuting two and a half hours, the money you have left over for food, like a box of cheeses is a dollar, right? 
Whereas fresh fruits and, uh, you know, the same amount of cheeses in fruits and vegetables would be $5. So if you have that little money to spend on food, what are you going to do? You're going to buy cheeses because it's a high energy snack. It's going to get you through the day and you're not going to feel hungry because it's high in fat and high in sugar and so on and so forth. And so I'm tired of people blaming Amer like, you know, fat, stupid Americans. I'm like, hmm. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. There's a reason that Americans are suffering from some of these things like the obesity epidemic, right? It's not that Americans are stupid or, or lazier necessarily. It's the experience. I like to say that humans are like a blank slate and then they change depending on the environment you place them in. So all humans were basically the same, but if one, this human you take and he grows up in Southeast Asia, or you take this human and she grows up in um, Europe, or you take this human and they grow up in South Africa, that's what will inform their experience. So I agree with you. Americans, part of the reason we're suffering from these health epidemics is because of the hyper-capitalist, hyper-consumerist um, society. And you're right. The prices are really fluctuating now. And there's a rental crisis in America right now. So people are really paying out of their bloop for these very high prices in rent and having to work. 60 hours, like you said, these very long work weeks. So one of the benefits, so some of the benefits, as we've discussed, of moving abroad is you have a different experience. You have a different eating experience, a different lifestyle experience, and that sense of community, which are which um, teacher Tess and I really appreciate and something that we're really working towards. And of course, we're going to get into the cons and some of the things that you are going to have to look out for. Of course, we're talking about health and wellness. So there are certain things if when you move abroad that you're going to have to consider. So, but these were some of the cons that teacher Tess and I have come up with. All right. So thank you, teacher Tess. Now, before we get into the cons, I just want to ask you specifically, do you have any tips and advice um, for moving abroad? So I, you, as we know, you've taught in, let's go ahead and talk about the places you've taught and lived. So I taught English as a second language in Vietnam. No, I didn't speak the, speak Vietnamese, oftentimes they like to hire teachers who don't know the language because they want to do something called immersion where the kids really have to work on communicating with you. So I taught in Vietnam. I taught in Thailand. I taught in the Czech Czechoslovakia, aka Prague, and I taught in Ecuador. All of these places I taught English as a second language. And I also taught um, cultural classes, like teaching them about American cultures and like American body language. Yeah. Okay. I forgot your All right, question. Great. And, you know, no, no, of course you taught. No, that's okay. I didn't really phrase it that well. So my apologies. And then of course she's taught in the United States as well. So oh, yeah. what are your some tips and advice you would give to people who are thinking about teaching or working or living abroad, especially in Southeast Asia or Europe or Latin America? My number one most important tip I could possibly give a human being. Okay. Look me into my human eyeballs. Okay. If you're traveling by yourself, whether you're a man or a woman, but especially if you're a woman, do not. I don't care what they tell you, because I had a lot of people say, oh, come to our small town. It's more of an authentic experience of our country. Do not fall for that. OK, if you're by yourself and you've never been to that country, no matter how much you read, you're not going to be prepared for what's about to happen. Right. Because everyone has their own skewed opinion. So you need to be in a major city for your first uh, teaching job. And this is why. A, all your resources are there. There's more people there that will, are going to speak English as a second language there. And your embassy is there. If anything goes wrong, you go to the American embassy. You understand me? I was got into some trouble because of not understanding things properly and was basically deported. Um, and... It's very important because what's amazing about the American embassy is that if something goes wrong and you're abroad, um, you go to the American embassy, they actually will buy you a ticket home. Okay, so that's one of the most important things I want to tell you is if you are an American passport holder, you have a right to they will buy you. Now, when you want to come back to America, they give you six months to pay back the ticket. But um you have a right. If you guys want to know more about this situation, please write in the comments below. I'm more than happy to explain this entire story to you. But for your first job, you want to be in a main city. Um, and another reason you want to be in a main city is that um, other expats, other people who are from your home country, they typically, they typically have community groups in the main cities. First of all, get a job in a main city. 
Step two, um, make sure that you know where the embassy is and that you call the embassy and, and tell the embassy what job that you're having and so on and so forth. Step three, find expats who can tell you uh, tips and tricks, things to avoid, places that will scam you um, and move forward. Um, it's important to live with other expats until you get your bearings. Now, once you get your bearings, you start learning the language, you start understanding how things are. Then if you want to move to a small town, you can. I don't really recommend small towns in foreign countries because typically, especially in developing countries, they have a very skewed opinion. They're, there's a very low education. They're extremely ignorant, especially if you're a woman in color. All they know about people of color is based on television. That's they see American television. And as we know, American developed television is very, very, um, doesn't show us in a positive light. So um, small towns are not like small towns in the United States, where small towns have similar access to information. Small towns in developing countries, people literally don't go to school and they have such a limited understanding of other ethnicities and groups that as a woman of color, I do not recommend you do this because it is emotionally taxing to be in a situation where the only reference they have to a woman of color is something like ratchet or, you know, city girls or some really, dis really disturbing image that they've seen. So again, um, be in a main city, know where your embassy is, find other expats to teach you tips and tricks till you get your bearings that's one of the most important advices that i have and don't believe everything you read on the internet very fantastic advice you know a lot of people are adventurous teacher test is adventurous i'm adventurous and a lot of times sometimes i think people get in over their heads right you see this beautiful picture a small town and you think i'm gonna dive right into this foreign country and go straight to the small town teacher test did that yep. and she ran into some troublesome experiences by doing that Just horrifying you know? experiences okay <laughs> Hor and i want to i want to add real quick so one one thing that yeah. really annoys me is 95 percent of the youtube videos or videos or commercials you see about teaching abroad are typically showing a european anglo person right so their their experiences are always glowing and wonderful and it's so great it's so amazing the people here are amazing Two, um, you have to take in consideration that a lot of developing countries, because they only see the positive image of Euro-looking Euro people, they think Euro people are amazing, they can do no wrong, they're these perfect, wonderful creatures. So um, they tend to kind of almost worship, you know, Anglo or Euro people. So all those- So hold on. One- don't just hold you. I just want to say this. You got sorry to cut you off to teach your test. Now we're going to talk about you guys, the the negative aspect or the potentially negative things that you can run into uh, by teaching and living abroad. All right. Especially in Southeast Asia or certain uh, in East Asia as well. Latin America, potentially even Africa. Um, so you heard the positive things that can happen when you move abroad, the experiences. Now we're going to get into some of the things, because remember, Anton's class is about health and wellness, and your mental health is very important. A lot of times people negate the impact of mental health. All right. So yes, yes. we're going to talk about some of the mental health aspects of living in Southeast Asia. <laughs> Thank you.